We're live. Okay. Thank you, Greg. And welcome, Presbyterian of Philadelphia. I'm Reverend Kevin Porter, your three-quarter time state clerk. And it's my honor today to open this up for our next conversation at the well. And I want to first express the gratitude of everyone involved at the Presbytery for all of you uh, taking the time and the energy to join us in this uh, opportunity to be covenant community, even if digitally. Um, as Greg was saying before we started, we know that the novelty of coming together by Zoom, the shine's kind of gotten off of that, but it still isn't a very important tool. And this conversation at the well modality is our uh, monthly model of uh, placing our corporate creative engagement, uh, a place for us to come together to share the living waters that uh, slack the th thirst of each of us, enable us to move forward in ministry uh, wherever God has planted us. And uh, we are very grateful for uh, the conversation that we're having today that's going to be talking about the self-development of people ministry of the PCUSA, uh, which is intentional in having both a national focus and a very local focus. And that's why we have both Todd and Alonzo joining us today. And before I turn it over uh, to Ashley to give the formal introductions of who is on our panel, I wanna just say a word about Alonzo here. Uh, I <laughs> haven't known him for many years, although he looks much younger than I do. I've known him for many years. And, and we're grateful that he's also gonna be our keynote speaker for our uh, Joint Presbytery of Philadelphia and Philadelphia chapter of the Na National Black Presbyterian Caucus uh, African American Heritage Celebration which is gonna be this Sunday at 3 p.m. Uh, so make sure if you haven't already signed up for that to go to presbyphil.org, find out that information. You don't wanna miss it. Uh, even if you've participated in the other ones in our past years, this one is gonna be very different as we uh, delve into telling our story, reclaiming our heritage and celebrating our future. So with that, let's cover our time today in prayer. Let us pray. A loving and gracious God, we do give thanks that in your providence, uh, you gave us life and breath for such a time and place as this. Lord, uh, although so much around us in our civic uh, sphere uh, seems to be filled with so much uncertainty and angst, we know that you're in the midst of it and that you've called us for ministry of proclaiming what it means to be a people of Christ for, for such a time as this. So come by here, particularly as we look into the unique and particular ministry of self-development of people so that its ministry may inspire us and we in turn could uh, add extra uh, energy, intelligence, imagination, and love into that ministry. Uh, these and all things we pray in Christ's name and for his sake, amen. Now our moderator, Ashley Rossi, will take it from here. Amen, thank you, Kevin. Um... I get to be Greg today and remind everyone about the technology. Uh, really the most important thing is just to use the chat. I think since we are in panelist mode that our attendees cannot unmute. And so if you have questions, if you have comments um, along the way, please put them in the chat and Greg and I will be keeping track of that so that we can have some good conversation at the end of this. We are uh, welcoming Alonzo Johnson as Kevin said he grew up within the Philadelphia Presbytery. He is one of our own. Um, and so all of your accomplishments are now our accomplishments, Alonzo. Um, but we are grateful for you and for the many gifts that you offer as the national coordinator of SDOP, which is the self-development of people. Um, SDOP has been part of our denominational DNA for more than 50 years that they have been around to promote justice, build stronger communities and create economic equity wherever that is possible. And since Philadelphia has uh, signed on to be a Matthew 25 presbytery, um, the mission of SDOP certainly aligns and reflects those Matthew 25 principles, revitalizing our communities in faith, eradicating poverty, dismantling structural racism, all the things that we aim to do as a community um, they are already doing around the world. So 
We are also going to be hearing from our SDOP moderator, the Reverend Todd Stavrakos, and the work of our own SDOP committee. And so at the last Presbytery meeting, they did share some of their work, but today will be a chance to do a little bit more of a deep dive with them. So I want to tell you about Alonzo, besides the fact that he had nothing but glowing things to say about uh, Philadelphia. Um, he has been a minister and educator for more than 20 years. He is ordained in the Peace USA. Before he went to Kentucky, he was an active member of the Philadelphia Presbytery, serving as pastor of the Oak Lane Presbyterian Church. He brings experience in congregational, urban, youth ministries, and academic settings. And he brings the deep commitment and passion for the work of social justice and our witness as a people of the gospel. We are so honored and delighted to have you. And I'm honored and delighted to make your acquaintance today, Alonzo. So looking forward to all that you have to share. We yield the floor to you. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you so very much. It is, it is, it is good and pleasant to be with the family of Christ today and to be with my family in Christ in Philadelphia. Uh, you know, uh, that was, Philadelphia was a very uh, pivotal part of my ministry. It shaped me. Uh, and I think a lot of what I do, uh, I am a child of Philadelphia. And, and those that you see on the screen have been very, my very nurturing folks and friends who have been very uh, integral in, in, in my, my ministerial development. So uh, Philly is, is uh, very close to me. And again, it has been uh, one that has shaped my ministry, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, a place that have, that have really helped me think more about what does it mean to do God's will and God's work. And so, uh, so that's so, you know, I am few, I am Philly fueled in that way. And, uh, and, and excited again and honored to be with you all uh, today. Alonzo, I just, yeah, I just wanted to introduce our, our vice moderator, Reverend Ted Mingle, as our uh, other uh, panelists that's on the screen with you today. Ted, yeah. how are you? Yeah. Good to nice see to meet you, Ted. Alonzo, and sorry I had some tech difficulties. So uh, anyway, I'm back on and uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to be together and certainly your leadership in this important ministry, Alonzo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, the, the question I get often is, what is SDOP? right? That is like the question. And I think our name is a little ominous, right? The self-development of people. You know, what does that mean? I remember when I was a kid in the Presbyterian church, I would always see the self-development of people logo. I mean, everybody knows our logo of the flying people, right? And always wondered, what was that all about? And, and self-development of people has a really incredibly um, uh, rich and powerful history. And we have been really lifting up this history of self-development of people because it's been relevant uh, for conversation, uh, you know, especially uh, in, in days like this. In more contemporaneous times, as we talk about Black Lives Matter, as we talk about reparations, as we talk about uh, our social justice as uh, uh, main discourse, uh, anti-racism as general discourse. Not too long ago, I was in the, in the Target and I happened to walk around to the book area and it was all the books that we have been told to read, <laughs> right? It's all of them, Isabel Wilkerson, it's, you know, it's uh, uh, Abraham Kendi, all the books and all the things that we have been uh, reading to address the issues of race and, and poverty and how they are uh, in many ways interconnected and especially and how all three are interconnected on the Matthew 25 as we look at race, poverty and congregational vitality. Uh, SCOP has a really powerful history. We, we come out of the concern for reparations. That's where we were born in San Antonio, 1969, you know, uh, the great Gayward Wilmore, who uh, Reverend Dr. Gayward Wilmore, who we have lost very recently, was really one of the brain children of the self-development of people. And there were uh, Black Presbyterian folk who invited uh, James Foreman, uh, uh, the, the Black Panther, also uh, head of the uh, Detroit Economic Conference, uh, to come and talk to the Presbyterian Church. Now, Foreman, uh, before this, of course, Foreman had a, a reputation uh, Foreman uh, was part uh, of, the, of, of a group that created something called the Black Manifesto, which was a document that was laid out that demanded that white religious communities uh, would, uh, would pay the Black community uh, over $5 million uh, to, uh, to address uh, racial ills. And so one of the things that's very interesting uh, in that uh, conversation 
was that Foreman had been going to, to, to you know, churches. His whole thing was like, I'm going to go and I'm going to, I'm going to disrupt and say, you owe, you know, the black community this, this, this amount of money uh, to address injustices. Uh, we know that that happened at Riverside. Uh, and so uh, he was invited to uh, Presbyterian Church, um, that General Assembly in San Antonio. He came, he laid out the Black Manifesto. And as you can imagine, and, and the Black Manifesto basically laid out many of the kind of issues that we're talking about today, access to power for communities who have been maligned and communities who have been marginalized, uh, access to the kinds of um, wealth and power and, and, and social power, and not just wealth, but to media power. Right to uh, to manufacturing power, to to an employment power, economic power. So this document was really robust in bringing up some of the issues that were germane to uh, disenfranchisement and racism. Um, and of course, as you can imagine, Presbyterians loved this. Right, they were very happy that he was there. Uh, and of course, I'm joking. Uh, people were very very upset as at what they heard. But at the same time, uh, there were folks in the church who knew that uh, Foreman was right in bringing up these issues of, 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 of what needed to happen to address uh, um, uh, economic, uh, 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 you know, a lack of access uh, and economic disparity. So self-development people were born. Uh, you know, it's uh, our, our, our official name is the Presbyterian Committee on the Self-Development of People, right? So as Presbyterian as we can be, right? Folks have gotten together and basically, as they have gotten together, they have basically said, look, here, uh, we need to address, how, how does the church address these ills? We recognize if, if uh, economic uh, disparity is, 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 is sinful and comes from a system of, of racism, then what does the church need to do to address these issues? And how does the church uh, address the issues of communities who already know uh, how to, uh, to, to be able to, to, to deal with the issues uh, that they are confronting, and that, and, and understanding that we, for 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 a long time, as the Christian church, and I won't just say the Presbyterian church, but as the Christian church, has been operating in a model of, of paternalism, and so the folks who put self development of people together said, you know, how do we uh, how do we start to move in a way that's non paternalistic and that lifts up the gifts and skills and talents of our communities. And how do we uh, how do we learn from those communities and the kind of work they're doing? And what does the church owe to this? And 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 really, it's about the work of Jesus. Uh, earlier, Ashley mentioned one of our pillars, which is like you know uh, establishing justice. And so the idea of justice and righteousness being you know uh, you know sadika, right? That being the same thing, right? This you know that that to do right is to do justice. So SOP comes out of that 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 want to address. Uh, 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 racial uh, ills, to address uh, economic disparities, and also, uh, importantly, to lift up communities who own and control their own work. And so, and so that is what made SDOP, uh, you know, uh, powerful and, 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 and very popular uh, for uh, a long time. We were talking earlier about uh, so many uh, SDOP alum that has come in and out of the organization, right? Um, and we have had, you know, with uh, uh, great leadership over the years, in the 50 years that we have been uh, together uh, in existence. At the same time, you know, uh, self-development of people is really about, it was one of our ministries in the Presbyterian Church uh, that really brought folks together and address issues of, of uh, multicultural um, uh, uh, diversity and these kinds of things. How, how do we get people to work together uh, to, 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 to partner? And that's a real powerful word for self-development folks is the partnerships with communities. How do we partner with communities and how, what does the church have to learn from these partnerships? So again, moving away from this, this kind of colonial uh, uh, paternalistic way of doing ministry and mission, but actually walking and listening and, uh, and, and, and lifting up folks who only control their own work. So, uh, and for a long time, you know, self-development of people really instrumental in, in leadership creation, right? I mean, it was, uh, it was the ministry that dealt with these issues the, and continues to deal with these issues. The, the ministry that really um, said, hey, here's how the church uh, is really grappling with some of the issues that are going on in, 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 in the world. And, and it matters because, it matters for a bunch of different reasons. Self-development of people just, uh, you know, existentially, right we come from we, we 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 come from scripture right as we talk about matthew 25 i also think about luke when jesus comes open the scrolls and says this is what i've come to do i've come to bring good news to the poor i've come to set the captives free 
SGOP is an integral part of that work. We are part of that, that uh, poverty eradication. Uh, we are part of the work of Jesus Christ as the church engaging the world, partnering with the world to learn how it can, it can, it can be instrumental in, in bringing hope and transformation and freedom into, into the world. And so SGOP, why does it matter? It matters because it is about people. And it's about recognizing uh, the power of people. And also, and when I say that, there's so many different levels of that too. So it's, it's, it's our community folks that we walk alongside with, right? Who are not necessarily Christian or Presbyterian or any of those kinds of things. But it's also our, our Presbyterian communities, right? Uh, someone said, so where do you get your money from? Uh, the Lincoln Foundation? I said, no, we get it from the Pew Foundation. And that's the not the Pew Charitable Trust, but people sitting in the pews. So Presbyterian folk. Are the, are, are, the, are the, you know, are the, you know, you, you are the ones who support this ministry. And, and when I say that, it's important. Why does it matter? Because it matters that you, that we can be your extended hands and feet in the world to do these issues, to walk along uh, communities who are addressing issues of, uh, of trafficking or issues of, uh, uh, of, of, of employment or issues of racism or issues of, you know, you name it, especially in COVID, in this time of COVID-19, where many of our partners have been addressing those issues of all the ancillary issues with COVID-19 as they connect with, um, you know, uh, the elderly, with children, with those who are uh, to who are, are made vulnerable because of, of the time that we're living in. So SGOP matters because it, we are a really integral part of, of, uh, of poverty eradication and have been in this church for years. And as one of the, the one great hour sharing, a member of that family, which of course, as you know, is Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, and uh, Presbyterian Hunger Program, who are, we are, you know, a, a trinity of colleagues together, sister ministries together, that do this work of development and, and, and addressing the issues of need. And so we're important in, in so many ways. Uh, we're important because it is about, uh, it's about engaging our partners and addressing some of the issues that we're concerned about, but it's also about folks in the church being an integral part of, of, of that anti-poverty work. And, and, and we don't do this without you. And I think that's the most, one of the most important things that I can communicate is SCOP and One Great Hour we survive because you give, because you feel it's important that justice is had and that you feel it's important that people are able to find fairness and wholeness and hope uh, in a world that's, that's becoming more and more uncertain by the day, right? As someone said to me, I'm tired of living history now. <laughs> you know, and so uh, we, I mean, we're living in this time of, of where it's making history, right? Unprecedented times. And, but the, the, but the power and the hope is that, you know, in God's will and the will of Jesus Christ, who calls to, to bring these things to the poor, that we exist and we are still uh, operating and working and connecting and networking and partnering and all those other really good kind of uh, uh, verbs to throw in there. And so that's, and, and so that's, you know, that's, that's, that's the kinds of things we do. I, I would love, I want Todd to talk a little bit about kind of the local uh, Philly stuff that you all are doing, but some, a, a good, a few examples of some of the work uh, that we're doing is um, we, and I like to brag about many of our communities. One is uh, a group called Alianza Agricola out of Rochester, New York. And these were folks who, uh, Margaret Moale, who is my, uh, 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 who does community, you know, uh, community or, uh, outreach in, for SGOP, we had met with Alianza Agricola, who are farm workers, uh, immigrant farm workers that are in a part of New York that is actually a sanctuary county, but were concerned about the fact that they were not able to get driver's licenses to go and, you know, and pick folk up and take them to school, take them to work, these kinds of things. So they were fighting for that. Uh, they did. Uh, they fought for the, something called the Green, uh, the Green Light Program, which passed. Um, and in, in, in Rochester, and now they're able to do that. And very recently, during COVID, one of the members of Alianza Agricola penned this incredible article called Isn't My Life Important? Uh, and it was in the New York Times about COVID and farm workers. And so, uh, you know, those are the kinds of or, programs that we have been uh, involved in funding. Uh, many of you may know the Immokalee uh, workers in, you know, in, in Florida. SGOP was, we were one of the initial funders for the, uh, for the Immokalee uh, workers. But, you know, but it's not just farm work, right? Uh, we have funded Jobs Not Jails, a program out of uh, Massachusetts, and another one out of, uh, out of Massachusetts called EPOCA, which is another uh, kind of uh, re-entry uh, type style program. Uh, we have funded, uh, you know, the, the, a plethora of different 
programs, one called Damayan in New York City, uh, a group of uh, Filipino women who were labor trafficked, who got together and basically uh, are uh, activists against labor trafficking and also uh, activists in helping folks come out of labor trafficking. As you know, you know, any kind of trafficking has danger within it to leave. And so these folks have been really instrumental in those kinds of things. Uh, and so, and also in New York, we have something called Black Women's Blueprint, which is, uh, you know, uh, organization that are looking at the, the social issues as they concern Black women and girls. Uh, and, uh, and, and especially in COVID and how, you know, our, our, our BIPOC communities, you know, Black, Indigenous, people of color communities have been affected by, by, by COVID-19. So we've, we've got, a again, a plethora of different programs. And I know I want time to talk about some of the stuff you're doing locally, because I do have a story, too, about one of those programs uh, that you locally fund. Thanks, Alonzo. Um, you know, just the other day I came to church and I found a box waiting for me at the bottom of the stairs to my office and it was all my, you know, one great hour of sharing materials and, and I realized that we're all, you know, we're doing things differently these days, right? We're, most of us are virtual. Um, so a lot of these things may or may not be applicable, but we're dependent upon those, those gifts. Um, each year, uh, President of Philadelphia is able to give out anywhere between 15 and 17, 18 thousand uh, dollars to applicants uh, who contact us or who we go out and we find uh, who are doing wonderful work in the community. And these are all groups that are working um, to create dignity, uh, humanity, uh, and self respect. Um, basically, they're doing the gospel. Um, and so we, we partner with them and, and many of them are, are faith-based and many of them are what we would call secular. Um, we don't um, differentiate between the two because we know that God is at work and the spirit is at work through everyone. And we need to find ways to be in tune with what the spirit is doing uh, outside of our churches. So in, in the past, uh, Philadelphia SDOP has supported such groups um, as mentoring programs, uh, African-American men mentoring uh, younger African-American men. Uh, we've had uh, groups that are helping immigrants and refugees um, find health care and, and uh, be cared for in, in their new homes and their new communities. Uh, two years ago, we helped fund an organization that uh, works with uh, individuals who are suffering from uh, emotional uh, health uh, issues um, get back into the workforce. Uh, and so we worked with them to help them make that move back from, you know, taking uh, or being on public assistance and getting back into a job and having the dignity of, of getting their own paycheck and uh, getting back into the, to the workforce. You know, the pride and, and identity that comes from that uh, is so incredibly important. Uh, this year, um, a brand new group of, of individuals in Southwest Philadelphia uh, who are in the neighborhood of the commonplace, um, when the pandemic hit and many people in the community lost their jobs um, or lost their major source of income, they gathered together because some of them had uh, connections within uh, the food insecurity arenas and they pulled together and created a food bank for people within the community, including themselves. So not only were they interested in taking care of themselves, but they are also at the same time taking care of each other. Uh, and so that was one of our, our grantees this year. And the other uh, grantee that received funding this year is, is the wonderful group Why Not Prosper, uh, a group of women who have previously been incarcerated, who are out who are sharing their stories, who are talking to young women to keep them out of the criminal justice system, advocating for changes, much needed changes in our criminal justice system, as well as doing the work of helping people re-enter society. We, we as a society don't do nearly enough to help people re-enter society. And then we wonder why recidivism rates are so high. We wonder why people turn back to um, uh, 
opportunities that we that are illegal or 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 whatnot because we as a society do not work to create opportunities for people and why not prosper is one group that's out there that's doing that kind of work so i've only been involved in sdop in, in philadelphia for i think three years now um and the one thing that i am so proud of is the passion that of the people that we meet. These aren't folks who are doing this work who can, who are concerned about themselves. They they have a passion and love for others. And the work that we've supported locally is is people who have regardless of their own religious background are caring for others. And when it comes to spreading the gospel and being a part of that, um, this is of the highest level work that I think we do as a, as a church. I know all of our churches are involved in so many ways of helping other people. Um, this is one of the ways that we can reach outside of the church and work with people on a secular level who are doing the same work we are. Maybe they're just tired and they don't want to be part of the institution of the church because they've gotten burned before. Or maybe they've been hurt by a theological conversation that went the wrong way. But their hearts are still in taking care of God's children. And we can bridge uh, those divides. But we can't do it. You know, I love the Lonzo's, the Pew Foundation. I, that You, you, you got to trademark that, man. I mean, come on. Um, but we can't do it without your support. We really can't. And I know, and I'll speak for the rest of the SDO committee, I wanna be able to give out more than seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000 a year. And I know that we're all kind of scratching and, and clawing um, because we're all going through a difficult time. But really make sure people are aware of what the one great hour of sharing goes to, um, you know, between SDOP between um, the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance um, and, and other ministries, it's really important. Um, you know, it's one of those special offerings that that is so vital to the work that we all do. Uh, and so I'll just put in a plug for that. Um, it, for me, it's a pleasure to be here with you all and to be on screen with Alonzo, uh, my brother from another mother. We're, we, we are not twins. I know we look it, but, but uh, our, our hearts are one. Uh, and so thank you. Yeah, amen. I, we are so, I'm grateful for Todd and, and, and the members of the committee. Uh, I think it's Lo, Lois is on the committee and Ted and also the incredible Julia Hill. And so you have incredible people on your committee. I think the last time we met in person when before COVID was at the Commonplace. That's and correct. uh and so you know and there's a, a of course incredible history there of course you know i got an incredible personal history with 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 with, with one of the, uh, the, the the folks who've been involved in that uh but one of the things i, I want to share with you um uh, todd mentioned a, a, a program that came out of philadelphia and i think it was partnered this uh, a meant african african-american mentoring program that was partnering with uh, uh uh first african i believe it was at the time and, you know, and at SDOP, the staff, we get together and as we put together some of our materials, um, we sit down and we talk about what's really happening in the world. What do people in the church need to know about what their dollars are doing and what our local committees are doing and what our national committees and these kinds of things and international committees are doing. Um, and so, and we get pictures, right? So we ask, uh, you know, we I call Todd, hey, you know, we call Todd and say, hey, could you send us some pictures of these folks that are doing this great work? So uh, we were in a meeting, uh, we were putting together um, the, the, the piece for um, this group, because they were going to be one of the groups, uh, African American mentoring group, that was going to go on one of our, our pieces of literature, the pictures. And so I, you know, uh, I asked, so what's, what's the pictures look like? And we project this stuff. So as we're working, we project all this. Uh, picture goes up, I'm in tears. Uh, and so the room, my staff is like, okay, uh, you know, is Alonzo all right? But, you know, Alonzo, you okay? Why are you in tears? And I said, um, the picture that you put up there of these two boys are two boys that came from my youth group at Oak Lane Presbyterian Church. 
And they said, no, it can't be. And I just reached in my, my, my bag at the time and pulled out the picture of when I baptized those two boys. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, and it was just recognizing the connection and the fact of the matter that like they had been involved, whatever they learned from the church, from, 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 the, you know, from all the, 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 the grandmothers and people who loved them in Oak Lane Presbyterian Church and nurtured them, whatever they learned there, they bought to this program. And, and, and they thought it important to, to be mentors themselves. And I just couldn't believe it. And I was like, you can't make this up. Like here I am, and I've got a picture of these boys that I, I, I baptized in that sanctuary at Oak Lane Presbyterian Church. And just showing you the connection of, 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 of how incredibly powerful this work is, self-development of people. And, and, and Todd's absolutely right. This is about the gospel. I mean, it really is. It's about living the gospel. It's about being steeped in the gospel and understanding with our tradition, uh, you know, our spirituality that, 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 Poverty alleviation is about, it's about spiritual practices. And it's about being able to have those conversations with our community partners and walking alongside them. I know that Philadelphia, you all are doing incredible work. I'm just, I'm, I'm, a, I'm always incredibly excited and proud to see just all the work that you've been doing in addressing poverty, in addressing racism. Uh, you know, you've been a Presbytery that is, a, you know, your model. You know, you're doing this work and bringing folks together and it's, and it's your leadership. And when I think about STOP, and how it can help, you know, walk alongside with you as well. I'm honored to know, like, wow, it's great to know that we could be a resource, and it's also great to know that we, you know, we can be a resource in so in so many other different ways too. And so uh, I'm, I'm I'm incredibly honored of the work that's going on, and 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 I'm honored because STOP is so much larger than I can ever be. Uh, the power of STOP and the lives that it's transformed in the church and in communities. I just, uh, it, it, I mean, are vast. And to hear from folks whose family members have served in SDOP, right? Who, uh, folks who, you know, who have, we, we call SDOP alum. Uh, and to know of all the work that we have been able to do uh, in our communities is really powerful. Uh, and so, and again, and just as Todd mentioned, I mean, we, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's an amalgam of different types of work we do, right? So it's, you know, this is about being only controlled by the direct beneficiaries, the folks that are, in the community doing it. The folks that come together, the parents that come together and say, hey, we need this to happen. Uh, it's the kids that come together with some of the parents and say, hey, we need this to happen. It's the folks that get out of prison and say, hey, we, 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 we come together because we need these skills and we can't get them anywhere. And here's where we can start to develop them ourselves. Uh, and, you know, and, it's, and you know, it's the women's organizations who say, you know, um, you know we, 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 we want to stop this violence. Uh, we want to stop these particular things, these injustices that, that, you know, the glass ceiling and those things that prevent us from being who we can be. So just wanted to kind of add that little piece, that little story, because I, you know, you just can't make that up, right? It's one of those Holy Spirit stories that happens and being proud of STOP and knowing that, you know, wow, two of my kids are doing some work and doing good work in, 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 in mentoring. So exciting for us. I love it. I love all the stories and the programs that you've shared so far. Um, it really makes me want to kick up our one great hour of sharing and giving. Um, so that being said, a couple things. One, we really want to encourage people to um, be more informed about one great hour of sharing. And I think maybe at the end of this, so that we don't forget it, you guys can give us some ways that we can really get our congregations directly involved. Um, but save it for the end so it sticks. Um, that, um, we're also taking questions in the chat. So please feel free to ask some questions of Alonzo and Todd. And if you guys don't mind, I'm going to kick off with a question for you. So I heard, Alonzo, you talking a lot about moving away from paternalism, which is a real issue in the church and especially the white church. Can you talk a little bit about, or maybe even give an example of a program where SDOP made sure that they were not in a paternalistic type of position, but empowered their recipients? I think most of, uh, so that's, that's a good question. Um, you know, Ashley, it's, so there's, there, there are about three resources that I can think of right off the bat. One is decolonizing wealth. Uh, from Edgar Villanueva. Uh, uh, one is uh, uh, Toxic Charity uh, from Robert Lupton, Presbyterian minister. Uh, and the other one is called Dead Aid, and it's from Dambisa Moyo, 
who is um, you know uh, African economist. And one of the things about uh, you know the, the the kind of paternalism and 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 let's and and the colonization of how we do things is thinking what we know people need, right? This idea that we think we know what people need, uh, and and really what STOP when it was uh, you know discovered it recognized that part of uh, what we would now most famously call white supremacy culture uh, is determining what people what's good for people. Um, and, and, you know, good example. So I'm traveling with um, uh, some, uh, some friends. One is the incredible uh, Valerie Nodem uh, from Press Train Hunger Program and, uh, and Luca Sikoye, who was part of PDA at the time. We were in Africa and we were in Sierra Leone and we were talking about the, you know, the, the conflict in Sierra Leone. And we had funded something international uh, through uh, our international staff person, uh, Teresa Vidart, who was amazing. And we have funded something, something called the, the West Africa Initiative, in which we travel to parts of West Africa who were doing beekeeping and all kinds of things, you know, and you know, to 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 up the economy and and, and those kinds of things. And it's one of those 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 things where you learn, um, you know, you see wells everywhere, right? And my question was like, so why are these wells working? And and Valerie was like, well, because these people didn't ask for that. And so, you know, uh, you know, you want to bring, you want to build toilets and wells in places where people didn't ask for them, because the people had never been consulted about what it is they actually really need, right? And so, and so, it, it's that kind of paternalism. If you, if you've never had the chance, I would read Lupton's book, Toxic Charity, uh, and also uh, read uh, Villanueva's book, um, Decolonizing Wealth. Uh, and, and, and because I think that, I mean, there's so many examples of this in our communities that we worked with. Uh, we work with a community. One of our communities is in um, City Roots Land Trust in Rochester, uh, New York. Uh, these folks are land trusts. You know, they're concerned about homelessness, regentrification, uh, or, or gentrification, land gentrification. They're concerned about how these issues are affecting the poor. And so, you know, their concern is like this, you know, A, you know, uh, do we do we do this for people or, or are people going to stand up and say, hey, we, we want this to stop and we're going to find a way to do that. And this land trust are the community of folks that come together and say, we will purchase this house. We will we will we'll keep these houses affordable. And this is not, an, or, you know, it's, it's not a company. It is a group of community folks. And I think that that's the power of, of people, you know, and um, and I we first uh, encountered community land trust, uh, these folks. Um, in Rochester in a conversation that we were having about uh, homelessness and also a conversation we were having about the book Evicted. If you have not read that book Evicted yet, um, uh, you should do so. Um, and so we were talking about, so what is it gonna take to address some of those issues of, of ownership, land ownership, gentrification? And it's about community folks having the skills to do this kind of things, creating the opportunities for folks in the community to be involved. A lot of this comes from the community. These are folks that say, hey, we got tired of being pushed out. We got tired of not being able to afford where we live. And so it's recognizing that it's listening. And one of the things that's really powerful, um, the, the theologian Paul Tillich says the first uh, lesson of love is listening. And I think it's the listening. You know, we listen to what one of the most powerful things I've learned from SGOP is how do we listen to communities? How do we, how do we stop and say, okay, let's, let's put aside all of our, our uh, assumptions about what we think should happen and listen to communities and let them learn and let us learn from them about how we can be partners. I think a really great example of this, our, our organizations, like when we look at um, you know, Black, Ma Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the idea that you know, uh, you know, we get to determine how you will partner, right? Listen to that. The church needs to listen to our community telling us this is what's important. You think this is important, but this is important. Uh, and, and communities know best. And I think that once we begin to listen to our communities and walk alongside our communities and not think that we're going to just, you know, we're going to, all of our communities are going to run into our churches and give us tons of money and, and give their lives over to Jesus. But to be realistic about how do we walk alongside our communities who are facing various things and be Christ's presence in those communities. Yeah, some may come to church, absolutely. But at the same time, many communities are already in, 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 in formalized communities and need partners. And I think that that's the, those are the kinds of things. 
Ashley, I mean, when, you know, just talking to organizations, when we go to meet with organizations, I'm always in awe as to how these organizations have come together. You know, Alianza Agricola told us, I mean, and this was, we were talking to these folks, I mentioned them earlier, and all this conversation was in Spanish. We had a translator, which is one of my goals is to learn Spanish, because I think we all need to, all of us who do not speak need to learn it, we need to learn the language. Uh, and as we're talking, one of the guys, Luis, turns to me in English and says, we just want to have the same things that, that your kids have. We want the same opportunities. We, 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 want our, we, want, we want people to be healthy. We want, we want people to have rights. Uh, we, we, we want what anybody else wants uh, for their children and their families, especially since we're picking this food, since we're doing this work. We, we want these things. And so it's listening to our communities and listening to what they have to say because they know best. That's the thing. I, I love being Presbyterian, but we don't know everything. You know, I know that's hard for us to, 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 to you know, imagine, but we don't know everything. And, 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 but communities do know. They do know what they need. And they do know how things can be changed. Those communities are communities that will grab us by the hand and say, this is how you advocate with us. This is how you walk with us to do this work. And so it is that listening, that, that, that deep listening that, that needs to happen, that thick with listening to what's but going what on. But what if I've read all the books, Alonzo? I mean, I'm well, kidding. Well, I'm again, kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, actually, <laughs> actually, I'm just glad. No, actually, I'm glad you mentioned that because I think sometimes we think that that is the way, right? If we read this stuff and we become more knowledgeable about this, about this stuff, then it makes us better people. Well, it could, but the reality is, is that, you know, it is about action, it's about doing, right? Uh, you know, so how do we take what we've read and actually put it in action? And I think that that's the harder jump. It's easy to read about something because these, these things are connected, right? Poverty and racism are intersectional issues. One of my favorite people that speak on in intersectionality in the church is uh, the Reverend Shania Leonard. Uh, 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 Shania is a sibling that speaks clearly to like, you know, what is it about? To un We can't understand anything without understanding the intersects. Mm -hmm. And the intersection of poverty and all these kinds of things, you know, like you said, actually, we could read the book, but unless we start to live, we have to live this, we have to do this, we have to actually risk doing ministry. And that's hard for us, right? And, 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 and what we call white supremacy culture, the idea of perfectionism, the idea of getting it right, saving the world. And it's about risk. It's about loving. And, and it's about not doing it right a few times. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's about that we're not going to get this right. Um, communities are great in helping us learn this. So the other really important part of this is relationships. How do we create relationships? With, with communities who are doing incredible things. And I think that's the great thing is understanding, you know, one of my other, I, I also double as the convener of the Educated Child Transform the World Initiative for the church, uh, Presbyterian Church USA. And the reality is it's the same kinds of things. We're listening to, listening to students, listening to teachers, right? Uh, listen, you know, listening to, uh, you know, listening to the, the families of these students, right? Listening to school administrators. How we, how, you know, how do we be involved in this work? And I think STOP has been really good at cultivating uh, this kind of idea of uh, non-paternalism and, and, and listening and walking alongside. Uh, and that has been a really good, I mean, for all of our people that have come in and out of STOP, that has been one of my learnings uh, that they have learned how to listen. They have learned how to say, okay, what, what are the communities will tell us what they need. And Alonzo, I, that is such a powerful answer. Sorry, Todd, go ahead. No, I, I and I was going to say that that the the SDOP program to me is vital in the church because it gives us that anchor. It it keeps us in in contact with communities that you know if we're honest with ourselves, we frequently try and flee from. You know, it, it's and. The fact that we are engaged not just with faith-based groups, but groups that are secular, that are on the ground doing the work, uh, and one of the words that that you know Alonzo when he comes and does trainings for the different SDOP groups, we talk about agency. Who has the ability to to act and to work, and who's going to be in control, and who's who's bringing the ideas, and and we're not, we're not coming in to give answers. We're coming in to, to lend support and to walk side by side, but we're listening to what those issues are. 
right. I would have never known that there was a tremendous issue of getting people with emotional health issues back into the workforce and that there are many things that they need to overcome to do that. But because SDOP was, was in a conversation with that community, I now know about that. Mm -hmm. You know, so how many things could we know if, if all of our churches took a little time and said, hey, look, let's, let's use the model of SDOP to engage in communities that are doing work and are working to support their own community. And let's listen to them. But thank you so much. I wanted to ask about systemic racism as well. And I have a feeling, Alonzo, that you would um, be telling me a lot of similar answers. And I appreciate that you linked um, white supremacy culture in because that is certainly something that we are hoping to address more thoroughly here in the Philadelphia Presbytery. I want to um, ask a question on behalf of BJ Agarwal, who's one of our attendees. He wrote in the chat, how do we more effectively partner our local efforts with the national programs? How do we share success stories and solutions to these common challenges? Uh, one of the ways we do this is by uh, just uh, conversations, having, uh, uh, you know, communicating. One of the things that um, staff at SDOP, uh, Margaret Morley, uh, who I work closely with, who is, you know, my, she is the SDOP community uh, engagement. Uh, she, uh, Margaret is very good about making sure that we're hearing from our local SDOP folks. And, 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 I, and I think, this, so this learning is tiered, right? In so many ways, or maybe it's dynamic more than tiered because uh, it's not really hegemonic, but it's tiered learning, right? We, because we learn from what Todd and, and the local community is doing there. We learn about what's going on in Philadelphia because again, we don't know everything, right? But what we learn from the work that Todd uh, and, and, and the local STP is doing is uh, we learn about how do we, how do we uh, interpret the work of the church? And I think one of the things that's really powerful about that is having those conversations. Um, one way we do this is that we call us or, you know, Margaret will put something out and we will have conversations with our local committees. Uh, but uh, it's, it's just, you know, making those relationships with each other, with our, with our local committees and having conversations. And one of the things that we find important is continuing to have those conversations because what we learn too is that our local committees are learning from each other, right? One local committee says, hey, we're having a real issue trying to interpret the work of SDOP because this is, you know, a lot of what we do is not 15 second elevator speech, right? So uh, some folks are like, look, we're having some issues trying to, um, you know, uh, talk about SDOP. How can you help? And Todd can say, hey, what helped us in our local committee is when we did X, Y, and Z, and this is what got people excited, right? So it's that, that so we encourage our STOP family, right? National committee, uh, you know, uh, you know, presbytery, a synod, uh, STOP. We, we encourage them to come together and we make space for that. So we will have, we have phone calls and we are trying to develop kind of a toolkit that will come out of the conversations that we're all having uh, about how to interpret this message how do we work together? What kinds of things are, are you know, uh, you know, what should we be looking for when we're looking at projects? Uh, what's the best way to have um, conversations with, with, uh, with, pro with, especially with communities who uh, don't speak English, don't speak Spanish, right? Uh, how do we have those conversations about communities that are that are way underrepresented? Uh, and so, and and so, we are constantly making opportunities to to connect and have those larger conversations. I hope that answers the question because what we try to do is remind people that we are one big family of, of, of workers here in STOP doing this work and, uh, and that we're here, the national office is here. Uh, we're here to, 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 to share and also to get communities to share. Um, one of the most powerful things that, that uh, you know, we have access to and always remember this because this has been one of the most golden uh, kind of features of this ministry, if you will. Uh, we were, uh, a, a university called us and said, hey, you know, we hear you do all this different stuff. Uh, we're doing something on human trafficking. Is there any way you can talk to us about it? And we did, and we, and we brought Linda from Damayan to speak to them. And, and they spoke directly to Linda, who's doing this work. Uh, they spoke directly, and that's the kind of access that we have in this ministry of SDOP, of these communities who do this work. Uh, you know, you want to know about prisons? 
connect with the with, with the folks you just funded. Have them speak at presbytery meetings. Uh, make some spaces in your church to come and meet these organizations that we partner with to say, here's the issues that matter. And here's why we're, we're thankful for SDOP or thankful for the Presbyterian Church. And this is how we can partner with you. And so it's, but it's, it's all about relationships and communication, right? We are, we foster it from, from you know, from the national office, uh, our local committees, our national committee, which is, you know, we have about a good 16 people in all different regions. Our national um, committee representative in Philadelphia is Rick Morrow, who is from Philadelphia area. Uh, and Rick is also, you know, engaged in, in, in interpreting the work of SDOP and really getting people excited about what's going on. If you all watched the Spirit of General Assembly uh, uh, recently when, we, when they lifted up that youth organization in Karen Brown, Karen Brown is our chairperson of SDLP. And that youth organization uh, was one of the organizations that were funded years ago from SDLP. And so, it's, uh, so you, you've got, and I want church people to know this, that you have, uh, you have, you know, you, you, you have resources through SDLP, you have people resources. Um, and, and, and you have uh, relationship resources and partnering resources. And so know that, utilize the folk that you uh, fund. They'll be willing to speak. They'll be willing to come and educate folk. Make those relationships happen. We try to do it with our local committees and also with our communities. And, and being on the, you know, the, the flip end of, you know, being on the local level, um, because SDOP funds at different levels, local levels, synod levels, task force levels, national levels. Um, I, I frequently get, I'm frequently copied on, on applications and so forth so that I see what else is going on and, and can get an idea on the other groups that are out there that are being funded. Um, you know, and, and I, there's always a challenge in the connectional church. We know that, you know, sometimes the communications work well, sometimes they don't. I, that, that's just part of the human dynamic. Um, but I have to say, um, you know, the amount of communication that we, that I receive, um, whether it's Margaret, whether it's Rick, um, Alonzo, uh, it, it really does flow both ways. And there are plenty of times that, that at, you know, at least quarterly, I can think of Zoom conversations that the chairs are a part of, just touching base, seeing where people are at. Um, and, and it does flow. It, it can get better. Um, Absolutely, but it, it, it still is impressive to see what's happening. Tan and Alonzo, um, can you tell us a little bit about how this work has impacted your personal spiritual development? That's, you know, um, so incredibly powerful question. And, uh, and I say that because as we are living into Matthew 25, um, it's important for us to understand that, you know, uh, that it, for me, it's understanding that anti-poverty work is really integral to who we are as God's people, right? I mean, just, I love the Poor People's Campaign because they understand the importance of the moral dimensions of this. I was in a conversation with the incredible Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris earlier today. And what always inspires me about Liz Theo Harris and William Barber is the emphasis on spirituality, spiritual practices, and, and, and this being a very integral part to doing this work. For me, it has enhanced how I understand poverty on a, on, on a spiritual level. And how do I understand you know, what it is I, I give? Uh, one of the most important questions years ago, I remember when uh, Philadelphia Presbyterian went through a, a missional church phase and we were talking about these things. And one of my favorite questions out of that, or actually favorite statements out of that was, that our church budgets, our personal budgets are theological documents, right? They tell us what we spend money on. And I think for me, it's helped me kind of look at uh, what do I need to do as, 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 God's, as God's people? And how does that integrate into my faith, into my devotional life, right? Um, you know, how do I look at, you know, Lord, show me, uh, you know, uh, sh show me what, what needs to happen. Uh, I, I think a great prayer and I would love to put this kind of uh, devotional together is, you know, Lord, show me how not to be paternalistic. Lord, make me open to the fact that people know how to solve their own problems. Lord, make me open to be a part of your will, even if it's I have to shut up and listen 
and just walk alongside, right? And that's hard for us, right? Because we gotta, we gotta fix, we gotta. And so it's so for my own spiritual life, it's really helped me understand that that this is this is about spiritual practices. With that said, this is about our worship, right? This is about integrating. I, I wrote an article recently about worship, and well, actually, not so much worship, but communion and the connection of communion and anti-poverty. But this is about our worship, how we do worship, right? This is about the songs we sing. Uh, if you don't have it already, the companion guide to peacemaking that came from the peacemaking um, program has a great, uh, we've all helped, you know, Carl Horton has asked us to help compile this stuff. And we talked about poverty, but we also, in doing the research, lifted up all the places in the hymnal where you can find songs about poverty. We lifted up places, you know, here's where you can find Bible studies from Horizons that address the issues, Margaret Amer's Bible study. Here's we can, so a lot of it is how do we integrate this into uh, uh, our, our spiritual lives? One of the things that Oak Lane uh, taught me, and I, and I like to say that because we think pastors, here's what Oak Lane taught me. Uh, Oak Lane always taught me that, uh, you know, if, 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 if you can say whatever you want at that pulpit, whatever theology you want to come out of your mouth, but if it doesn't work, <laughs> if you can't live it, and, and, and it doesn't love, and it doesn't connect, you know, then it's not real. And, and a lot of it is, is finding a way to know that, you know, that, that anti-poverty is part of spiritual practices. It's part of who we're called to be. It's in our tradition. It's in, it's in a few of our confessions, even our early, you know, uh, check the Westminster Confession. There's some, there's some really, some really groovy stuff about like, you know, uh, about being stingy. Check Calvin, right? Check our tradition. I mean, we talk about, you know, uh, anti-poverty uh, is a really integral part of who we are. Whether it's uh, you know uh, you know Belhar or uh, or our hymnal, you know, so ways to integrate these things into our worship life, and that's really important, so that it never you know it doesn't become something that is uh, an elective, or it doesn't become something that we can differentiate from, but comes a part of who we are. Let me, uh, and I and I'm pretty sure we need to wrap up in a second, but Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, wrote that the church is where Christ is, not vice versa. What? I'm I'm a I'm a white middle-aged dude. Um everything in society has worked for me. Uh and I certainly would have the tendency, even if I'm the most well-read, um the most want to do the right thing kind of person in the world. Um, without the example of SDOP, me seeing where Christ already is working, um, you know, that's the subtle reminder of, it's not about you, Todd. It's not about you, Gladwin Presbyterian Church. It's about where Christ is. And SDOP goes exactly where Christ is. Beautiful. Well, before we wrap up, remind us how we and our churches can best support SDOP. We know one great hour of sharing. Is there other things that we can be doing to share your stories, to share um, the incredible work that's happening? Yes, Ashley. So uh, March 14th is Self-Development of People Sunday. And that's the Sunday that's on our Presbyterian calendars that we use to talk about SDOP and interpret the, the work of SDOP. Uh, in time for the collection of one, you know, one great hour sharing collection on Easter. But here's, uh, I, I would like you all to go and uh, very, I, I believe we have it ready. Uh, get your hands on the SDOP Sunday um, uh, manual. It is free. It's PDF. And what the SDOP uh, uh, Sunday resource does, it lays out some of the organizations that we, you know, we've worked with. We've made it pretty uh, uh, um, pretty much we've tried to make this a resource that, you know, you can share um, uh, in, your, in your digital services, but get a copy of that PDF. If you're looking for a copy and you don't see one, contact us. We'll make sure you get it. Also, uh, what we are we're doing as well is we're working on a few um, kinds of uh, STOP uh, uh, interpretation pieces so that we can have them ready for many of you who do digital services. So that you want to do a one great hour sharing, bam, pop it right in there. And it, it may be one of our national committee people talking about STOP. But we are working on a few things and we've just finished recording some things with some of our, a few of our local folks, one being Francis Miller in Cleveland, 
uh, another being folks in New York City Presbytery, um, uh, 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 Madge McKeithen. So we will have those things uh, available uh, to you. We have the resources to help you to, to be able to uh, interpret this and also to walk with you as you continue to be a Matthew 25 church. Know that we are referenced for you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I feel uh, so much better educated about this and so inspired by it. And um, I'm preaching March 14th, so karma will definitely be hearing about SDOP. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you, both Todd and Alonzo. And we look forward to hearing more from Alonzo this Sunday, March, or March, February 14th. Uh, please join us as was linked in the chat for our African-American heritage telling our stories worship. So thank you. That being said, Rev Ted, can you close us in prayer? Sure, Rev Ashley, happy to do that. I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul's words of gratitude to the church in Philippi. As he said, I thank God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of our partnership in the gospel being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. Alonzo, your words today have inspired us, and we thank God for you and your dedication and commitment to the self-development of people ministry, and we are so glad that we have partnered together in this vital gospel message of partnering with groups of people in our communities that are in low-income situations that desire for their lives and communities to be changed. We believe wholeheartedly that God is about to do something new as the prophet Isaiah declared. And there are gonna be new pathways in the wilderness and rivers in the desert that God is leading us to through this ministry so that God can continue to do his work through us so that people's lives and communities can be renewed and restored with the hope of new beginnings. Thank you, Alonza, and thank you too, Todd. And we are so blessed that we can partner together in this vital ministry of the church. And now let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for bringing Alonzo to us today and for his work through the self-development of people ministry that you have called us to partner together in so that lives and communities in need will be restored and renewed with new beginnings of hope. Lord, we pray that you will continue to remind us as we have spoken together at the well today to continue to be committed to these important conversations, but not just conversations, Lord, but discussions that lead us to action. As your prophet Micah declared, what does the Lord require of us to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God? And Lord, we pray that we will be your vessels of justice and mercy through words and deeds and especially to your children that are hurting and in need. And may this ministry of SDOP continue to be a light of your love and hope in Philadelphia and beyond. This we ask in your name and all of God's people say together, amen. Amen, thank you.